Laura said, well, right here at the end of the conference, um, I would be happy to regress you. And if there is any material that comes out of the regression that I could use for my book, which I'm just finishing. Do you know which um, book that was, by the way? Was it one of the convoluted universe books? No, oh, it, it was called The Custodian. Oh, wow. Do you have any communication now, do you think, with Dolores? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, she's very much guiding. She and uh, another level three practitioner, Sarah Bresman Cosme, who does a lot of interviews with Gaia. Um, the, the two of us are working very closely together. And I, I interview and work with Julia Cannon a lot. We I'm having an interview with her tomorrow. But yes, very much yes. so, very much so. And I know that you had a personal relationship with Dolores and in a lot of ways you were very similar to her. Yeah. So I'm not surprised that she's, I've got the message to call you in and to help you too. <laughs> so it's very synchronistic for me. Uh-huh. Good. I w I'd like to just uh, tell you uh, just a cute little story. Um, at one of the international UFO congresses, uh, Dolores and I had already been friends, and I think she had already regressed me two times to an extraterrestrial encounter that I had had. And um, so here we were after that, months later, um, at the International UFO Congress. And at the banquet, uh, they had a musical group, a band, and a dance floor put up in the banquet room. And so I was just sitting there with friends, listening to the music and talking with friends. And suddenly there was a tap on my shoulder and it was Dolores and she said, come on, Barbara, we're going to dance. But so <laughs> she practically pulled me up out of my chair and we went to the dance floor and did, dance, you know, contemporary type dancing. And, and I was just laughing through the whole thing, just that. Dolores and I, you know, much older ladies than, than many people there, <laughs> um, were, were dancing away and having such a good time. <laughs> that, that was her spirit, you know. Absolutely. Well, that'd be fun to dance with Barbara. So, you know, and there was no question I, I could not have gotten out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love to dance anyway, so that was really fine. But, yeah, oh, gosh, it was just so cute. There, that oh, what a beautiful, there. what a beautiful story. Well, why don't you tell us about the, how you first met and came into contact with Dolores and her work? Well, I must have met her at one of the early um, international UFO congresses. I, I think that's the most likely place. But anyway, um, I, I was already doing this work of doing regressions with people who'd had extraterrestrial experiences. And before that, um, I had been concentrating on regressing people to their past lives. But then in 1991, uh, people started coming for the reason of, um, you know, being regressed to unusual experiences that they had, that they wanted to know more about, and that usually turn out to be an extraterrestrial encounter. So so anyway, I was already doing that work. And um, I'm also a psychotherapist, so I was doing my regular therapy work, but still uh, doing quite an amazing amount of uh, regressions to people's extraterrestrial encounters. So I, I believe that we met at one of those conferences and knew that each other were doing that kind of work. So, you know, we had a lot in common to talk about right away. And um, and just, you know, I had that nice sense of really liking each other and being happy to know each other, just feeling a real uh, kindred spirit Yeah, there. And then um, she, somewhere around that time, uh, she was given the leadership of the Ozark UFO conferences, 
uh, Lucius Farish had been doing it before that, and she had been assisting him in in putting on those conferences. Uh, and uh, anyway, she then was taking over the leadership, and so she um, immediately that that first year of her leading it, uh, she invited me to be a speaker. So I went and to Arkansas and had more time with her and met Julia and uh, the other sisters whose name I'm forgetting at the Nancy, moment. She's Nancy, Nancy, yeah. Nancy, Nancy, Nancy was the one I was corresponding with mostly and um, m meeting that whole team of, of excellent people. And so I got to know Dolores better then and I went back for at least two more, maybe three more of those conferences to speak about a slightly different aspect of the extraterrestrial phenomenon each time. And of course, I'd always have some conversations with Dolores. And then in 1997, um, I had a very unusual experience one night coming back on the 101 freeway in Southern California uh, from a meeting uh, coming back to my home. And um, it was about a two and a half hour drive it was supposed to be. And I had done that drive many, many times. Uh, but, but I had a very unusual experience with some unusual features to it. And then, so it was about three weeks after that, that I was at a conference in Wyoming, a UFO conference, the Rocky Mountain Conference on UFO Investigations, given by wonderful Leo Sprinkle. And um, Dolores was there. We were both speakers. And in one conversation with her, I just mentioned, you know, gosh, I just had some really strange things happen recently. And, and she asked a little bit about it, and she said, oh, Barbara, you, you've got to be regressed. And I said, I know I've, I've been intending. And I had a colleague who lived an hour away from me who sometimes would regress me, and I would uh, do something like that for her. So I said, I've just been waiting to have time, but I've been really busy the last three weeks. So Dolores said, well, right here at the end of the conference, um, I would be happy to regress you. And if there is any material that comes out of the regression that I could use for my book, which I'm just finishing. Do you know which um, book that was, by the way? Was it one of the convoluted universe books? No, no it, it was called The Custodian. Oh, wow. One of my favorites. So anyway, she, uh, yes, it's a great book. So she um, regressed me. Uh, and oh, it wasn't, it, it turned out to be an extraterrestrial encounter, which I had not been really aware of specifically. I, I wondered about that. But um, anyway, I didn't know specifically until we got into the regression. But there was a being there, a tall, very, very white being with big black eyes. And uh, a very fine being, uh, I was very comfortable with him, liked him a lot. And he gave a lot of information and about why they had taken me and then about many, many other things about their civilization and their way of life and everything. And, and the interesting thing was that Dolores uh, kept asking me to ask him, the extraterrestrial in the regression, to ask him questions. And after a few times of her asking me, and then I would ask him, and he would answer to me, and I would repeat it to her, you know, kind of a slow process. Um, then he said, the being said, she can just ask me directly. Oh, wow. Wow. So now that raises a very interesting issue 
since that experience had actually happened three weeks earlier before we did the regression. In other words, we had to go back in time three weeks during the regression to relive that event. But even then, and, and I have no idea how this works. I don't think Dolores did either, but in terms of time, but it certainly seemed like she was right there talking to him too. Wow. He could hear her through me. So it's, incre it's incredible because, you know, Dolores always said that, you know, time doesn't necessarily happen at the same time, but it's existing at the same time. So what we see yeah. as this event and then the following event is all happening in the now. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I think that's the only way it could be, actually, even though I must say uh, that, that concept of everything being simultaneous yeah. is difficult for me to really grab hold of, to really trust, because uh, I and probably all of us here on Earth uh, have been so conditioned yeah. in terms of linear time, past, present, future, and that's how it is. There's no going back. You know, you're the same as everybody else. It's so difficult for the mind to comprehend because we see ourselves as a baby and then we get older and then we, you know, develop and we get married and all these events. And to think that, hey, that's happening all at once, but then we have past lives and other aspects of ourselves that are all existing right now. Yeah. Yes. It's very difficult. I mean, I can kind of conceptually get it that that's a theory but i i i don't feel it i don't really trust that but it but this experience um maybe you know is is helping me uh to think that well maybe that really is true because it went on for almost 2 hours that she was asking questions in the room with me, and I was in this altered state and was experiencing being on the spaceship with this be sitting in a chair um, facing that being, and, and he would say something. I would have to, she could not hear him but he could hear her, which is interesting, too, because, in other words, I could hear his answer, and then I would repeat it to her. But when she asked the next question, he could hear that. Wow. So that's, that's all your thing, but it happened for, for the two hours of the regression. Anyway, the material from that and from... The next regression we did, about two months later when she came to Los Angeles, um, all of that material put together, or, or most of it, most of that material she included in that book, The Custodians, which she was just finishing writing at that time. And I'm the, in the last two chapters of that book, The Custodians, but she uh, calls me Bonnie the Investigator uh, instead of uh, I Love that. I'm so glad that you shared that because often people don't, you know, want to know, you know, we, we use pseudonyms. I, so that... want... I, I was doing a lot of speaking at conferences and so forth and uh, MUFON meetings and and other groups too. And I, at in 1997, I wasn't really, really ready yet to uh, let people in audiences know that I too. But <laughs> 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 that was actually uh, my second encounter wow. uh, with extraterrestrials, and I've had two more since then that that I'm very aware of and had regressions on too. There might have been more, but that I'm not aware of. 
Yeah. Incredible. But, I mean, did you want to share a little bit of the information just for the audience of what those last two chapters of the custodians, what information sort of came through from your experience? Yes. Well, first of all, I think the whole experience itself was extremely interesting for me and not distressing, uh, surprising, yes, uh, but not not um, fearful the way that it unfolded. So actually, I mean, what happened is that I was driving in my Subaru wagon along the 101 freeway at midnight on a Friday night, and I noticed that there was no traffic on that freeway, and I thought, that's very strange because this is a major freeway, and it's it's only midnight. I mean, you know, people, somebody should be traveling on this freeway, but not a car in front of me or in back of me. And I thought that was really pretty odd. Hmm, oh, well, I, I was okay, and my car was okay. And then I saw off the coast, this is a, a freeway that goes right along the California coast in Southern California, and I saw a perfectly round flash of light off the coast, and it just it just went boom, and then out, just that quickly. But what is that? And then I saw an arc of light over the hills to my left, and I thought, you know, that's strange because I know that there is no no town, no civilization that would be emitting light um, over there behind those hills. I've, you, know, you know the area well, you, yeah, yeah. And in time, yes, and that noticed on the map and, you know, that there's, there's no civilization over there. So what's that big arc of light? And, um, and then I noticed a big truck. Uh, I thought it was a big trailer truck. It looked like a big silver like a cargo truck or something. And it was seemed to be parked half on the freeway and half off the freeway. And I slowed down a little bit because um, I didn't want to hit it. <laughs> also, I could see that there were what I thought were people <laughs> uh, walking around the back end of the truck. And there was some light there. At, at the back end of the truck. So I assumed, as we so easily do, I assumed that the truck had had a flat tire and the, the people uh, were walking around and had flares, those lighted flares, uh, you know, to ward off any oncoming cars. And so I went past them, and that's what I thought it was. But I did think it was that's amazingly long truck. I don't think I've ever seen such a long truck here on the freeway. And and then right after I passed the far end, the front end of this truck, suddenly there was a big flash of light crossing past my windshield right outside and a big crack, a big crack in the windshield right in front of my face. It was kind of like a spider web design of uh, of a crack, you know, lots of different lines to it. And, and I mean, I was just shocked. Ah, what's that? And I was concerned that maybe the windshield would uh, blow in on my face when I was... Because the crack was so loud, right? Oh, yes. And, and so deep into the windshield, it seemed. So I was going to... Uh, stop or slow down, stop, drive back in reverse to talk to those people and say, what's going on? My windshield has been cracked. What What are you doing? <laughs> but a big voice in my head said, no, don't slow down. Don't stop. Don't drive back. Just keep driving, driving, driving all the way home. And that's what I thought that I had done. But in the regression with Dolores, it turned out that right after I got past that front end of the truck, there was a big beam of light, which I was not consciously aware of, 
which lifted me and the car up in a uh, like a diagonal pathway of light um, up into the air and then straight up into a craft. And my car and I were slid along the, the floor in what appeared to be an empty room. Uh, so all of this I was not conscious of at all. And they made sure that I wouldn't be conscious of it at the time. And then I was fascinated because I'd say 20 or 30 little beings with big heads and big eyes and spindly little bodies, probably about three or three and a half feet tall, that they all swarmed from all directions around the car and were looking in the car windows and, and were even up on top of the car looking down through the windshield at me and, and coming up on the hood and, and all looking exactly alike with yeah. these big, big heads, little necks, little bodies. Um, and they were kind of a bluish gray and the the eyes the really big eyes um looked more like a, a a dark blue a cobalt blue and so there was something about them that just looked so likable so like little very curious children who were ex and curious and two of them um opened my passenger door and got in, now, even though I know I had locked my doors before I started that drive, but they opened the door, slid in, sat right on my purse and on little peppermint candies I had on the seat mm -hmm. to keep me awake. I should need it on my two and a half hour drive. <laughs> and then two others came and, and opened, even though it was locked, um, opened my uh, driver's door and took me out and and then kind of floated me upright across the room and through a door into another room. And that's when I saw a platform in the in one side of the room and a big column going up. And the column at, at the top had what looked to me like a metal helmet of some kind, almost like a beehive shape, a helmet. And it looked, it, my impression was that it had the holes in it and it, it um, had moving parts. It, it just had that look to it. I had never seen anything exactly like that before. So anyway, the little being sat me in the chair and, and did some sort of flick. I think it was akin to a seatbelt type of thing. <laughs> and there I was, the very um, hard chair, no padding at all, just and hard arms to put my arms on. And then they brought down that metal thing and put it around my head, particularly fitting it in around my temples. So it would fit my head like a, like a snug cap. Yeah. And then I started feeling what felt like an electrical current coming through that helmet um, into my head and, and through my whole body. And, and that went on for the whole session. So I was, you know, it didn't hurt, but I was a little bit concerned that it, it would not be injuring me in any way. Uh, but on the other hand, I was so busy looking at all of these little beings who sort of formed an apron in front of me, looking looking at me curiously with these big eyes and <laughs> nudging each other out of the way to get a better look at this human sitting there. <laughs> and I, I was very, very amused by that whole thing. And, um, and then, so that went on for... Oh, a couple of minutes, I suppose. And then I noticed that in back of these little beings, there was a, a tall 
white being, as white as the shirt that you have on right now, mm. that his skin was that white, and that but he had big black eyes that kind of were more upright like that, and so I don't really know what kind of being, what what the name of that species uh, would be, or if he told me, I have forgotten it. Yeah. Well, some people say it's like a tall white, I think is what the common term they use for a, a thin, tall, really white-skinned being. Yes, I, I know people who've had experiences with uh, what they call the tall whites. Um, so it, he might have been one of those, but but I'm not sure because his facial features and eyes he didn't did. look exactly yeah. the way they had described it. So. Anyway, but he was, uh, I would say, a, a wonderful being. And then when he noticed that I could see him, he said, "Ah, oh, Barbara. So obviously he knew who I was, even though I didn't know who he was. And he said, you're probably wondering what we're doing, what's going on. I think he was referring, I think, to that current. And he said, first of all, it's important for you to know that, that you're not being harmed or endangered in any way at all. We're simply uh, may, we're simply removing whatever is in your mind, your brain, um, about the work that you have done with other people who've had experiences with those of us who come from somewhere else in space. And then Dolores <laughs> piped in and said, Barbara, ask him, what do they do with that information? And so I asked him, and he said, oh, we broadcast it. And D Dolores then said, Barbara, ask him, <laughs> ask him who listens to it? And he said, oh, any of the uh, beings who who visit from other parts of space, who visit the Earth, and are very interested in what happens to people in uh, the the meetings with those beings, uh, they they would be interested, as as we are interested, and uh, that we meaning his group of beings. And so that's the information that we're taking is only uh, the information that, about what people have found in their work with you. Um, they're having had experiences with those of us who visit from other places in space. In other words, the extraterrestrials. Yeah. Yeah. And Incred they, incredible. Uh, are the whole round of questions. And um, often with Dolores asking the question, and that's when the being said, "Barbara, you don't you don't have to repeat what she says." He didn't use her name, but he was he was aware of Dolores during the regression, and he said she can just ask me directly. I will hear her, and I will answer through you, Barbara. So so that's what we did for. Uh, nearly two hours. Now, um, the material, uh, I don't, you know, I have conducted a few thousand wow. questions myself to other people's experiences with extraterrestrial since then. So I, I don't remember a tremendous amount, but basically it was a lot about um, his group of beings, his species, and his planet, and um, we even got into things like how they reproduce and so forth, uh, their customs, their way of living, their intentions, their interest in humans, and that type of thing. And if anybody would like to know the details of that experience um, they can, and that information, uh, they could go to Dolores Cannon's book called the custodians and all of this material 
is in the last two chapters of that book, yeah. in which she calls me Bonnie the investigator <laughs> instead of Barbara the therapist. Yeah. And because I wasn't really ready to be public about that at that time. I don't mind now, but um, at that time in 1997, I, I wasn't quite ready to mm -hmm. uh, discuss that in public, that I too uh, was having some experiences. Mm. Well, I remember that you shared, just as you said that, I remember that you shared it was in the early 90s um, when, and because you've done a lot of investigation around crop circles, and you were given the invitation to actually see one being made. And initially, it took you a while to get to the conclusion of, okay, I'll do it, because you had some hesitation with that, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, you remember very well. Yes. Um, in 1994, I had been working with a, a wonderful woman who, who was having extraterrestrial experiences. And... Not only did we do regressions, but she also um, occasionally, well, quite frequently, in fact, in my office, uh, would channel an extraterrestrial being. And we kind of got to know this being through her channeling and like him very much and trust him. Uh, he was a being from uh, the binary uh, star system called Antares on our maps, and we had many, many conversations, or I should say, I, through her channeling, was very blessed to uh, be able to have lots of conversations with this extraterrestrial being. So in January of 1994, uh, he told me, uh, well, he knew that I had been going to England for a few years to research the crop circles, and that I was very, very keen about that and was intending to keep going as long as I could in my life. So he said, Barbara, if you want to, you could be taken for the making of a crop circle. Wow. I mean, I, re I was really shocked uh, to hear that. And I, I was excited, but I also thought, oh, I don't know. That means I, I would be abducted. And I'm not sure that I want that. Here, I'm helping people with their abductions, but I don't know that I want to open that up and get into that for myself. So it took me six months uh, to come to the conclusion inside myself that, yeah, I, I, I would be willing to take that chance. I would be willing. In fact, I would like to, mm. you know, be taken for the making of a crop circle. So the last time he channeled and we had a conversation uh, before I left for England that July, um, I said, you know, I've decided I would like to be taken for the making of a crop circle. How, how do I let them know? And he said, he said, well, it's, it's up to you. He said, you, you need to talk to them and you need to do it out loud and you need to really mean it and convince them that you mean it, that you really would like to be taken for the making of a crop circle by them. And so, so <laughs> when I was driving to the airport to fly to England that July, um, I, all the way on the freeway, well, for about 45 or 50 minutes on the freeway, I was talking out loud to the beings who are responsible for making rock circles. And I was very emphatic. I, I started out more mildly, but the more I was talking to them and praising them, for the beautiful designs that they had made and the special energies that they leave in the crop circles. And, and um, you know, I had really, really been very involved with visiting in crop circles by that time and was giving a lot of lectures about them too. And so my enthusiasm was, was great. And I did respect and admire 
whoever they were, not knowing who they were, you know, who were doing this. So as I was talking to them for that, for, oh, 45 to 50 minutes, um, I, I could feel that I was getting more and more excited and probably more loud <laughs> in my talking to them. I think the whole talking said could have been done in my mind. But Telepathically, I, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that yeah. they communicate, I guess, them the, well, they are, they're way more advanced than we are. They don't need language, so to speak, so they can use that skill. You've probably seen a lot of that in your work, how they have the ability Absolutely. to do that even with humans, right? Oh, yes, yes. And um, so uh, it helped, however, for me to be saying it out loud because it it was, it was kept my focus on it more than if I had been doing it with my thought. I think my thought would have wavered more. Yeah. But, but I, hearing myself say it out loud, it kind of kept me on track. And um, so... They apparently got the message. <laughs> anyway, I uh, went to England, and uh, I was there for, oh, four or five weeks. Oh, wow. And did uh, some visits of other parts of England with, with my husband for a week or so, and then went down to the Crop Circle territory and, uh, and was there uh, for... Oh, probably at least at least three weeks, uh, visiting crop circles every day, and then on the night before the very last day, when I would have another opportunity to see crop circles, um, on that very last night, I thought, oh, you know, I don't, I don't think that that's happened. That's right. I was supposed to be taken for the making of a crop circle. <laughs> oh dear. So I was just getting into bed when I had that thought and turning out the, the lamp. And then I, in my mind, this time, in my mind, I asked again, please, this is my last opportunity uh, <laughs> to see the both of here coming up in the morning, and I would really like to be taken for the making of a crop circle. So right after I turned off the bedside lamp, I could see three beings, short, beings coming from the area of the window of the inn that I was staying in. And they were coming toward the bed. And I lifted my head a little bit from the pillow to get a better look. And then they retreated in, in unison, the three of them. It kind of lined up in a row. And, and then, uh, then I put my head back down again, closed my eyes, and they came closer, I know, because I peeked a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you were pretending to be asleep, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, pretending. <laughs> uh, but I did take a little teeny pink peek, and they were definitely coming toward me. And then I was out of conscious awareness until the alarm clock went off the next morning. So the next morning, um, I got up, not knowing if anything had, had really happened, but remembering the three beings that were coming toward my bed. Oh, wow. Oh, I wonder what happened. So anyway, um, I was traveling at that point with a group, a conference group, and we got into a big double-decker bus and drove for about 45 minutes. And I was on the upper deck so that I could look out across the fields that we went by to see if there were any new crop circles. We went along the same route that we had been on the day before, and we went past a particular field that I remembered because it had two of the big megalithic stones standing up in it, and then a row of brick houses past the end of the field. So as we went by that field again, this time there was a depression in the wheat field, in which there were those two big megalithic stones. And that usually is the sign of a crop circle having been laid down there. So when the bus stopped, 
oh, about half a mile past that particular field, um, I jumped uh, up and ran down the, the bus steps and out the door and joined a friend of mine who was following in a rented car. She was part of that group, too. And I said, there's a new crop circle right back there. You know, and she said, well, hop in. Let's go and find it. Let's lead the group right now. We'll join up with them later. So that's what we did. And two other ladies heard this, and they said, can we come? Can we come? So the four of us went back, went into the field, walked out through the, the tractor track to what was a beautiful crop circle. And we were the very first ones in it. It had just been made probably, oh, maybe three or four hours earlier, and it was still glistening with dew. And also it had a, a little energetic sound, which is like the sound that we make when we pour milk onto Rice Krispies. Ah. That little, very subtle crackling sound, popping crackling sound. That's that's what we found there as we right at the edge of the crop circle and stepped into it. So it was a really, really beautiful thing. Well, make a long story short, um, the next day after that, I flew home. And then I eventually, a couple of weeks later, had my colleague come and regress me to that previous night when I saw the three beings coming toward my bed. Mm -hmm. And regression showed that, yes, indeed, they came and they loaded me up out of bed and up through the corner where two walls meet the ceiling and up into the air and up into a little craft. And we flew a very short while by flight, which was equivalent to a 45-minute bus drive. Uh, to that field, and I uh, went over the field, and I could see through the big, uh, f wide front window of the craft. They had me sit in a barrel-shaped seat uh, facing what would be forward, and and the, the whole craft sort of tipped a bit so that I could see through that window that we were over a wheat field, and there was some light emitting from the bottom, apparently, of this craft, because there was light shining down. And the whole thing was a very quick operation. Um, I could hear and sort of feel that right near where I was sitting in the middle of the craft, there was a sound that came out, sounded like through the bottom of the craft, it like a big a fire hose had suddenly been turned on, a big whoosh sound. Yeah. And so it went whoosh, and then it seemed like we moved a little bit around to the side and whoosh, a little bit more around, whoosh, basically around in a circle. That's what it felt like with a swoosh every couple of seconds. And then we went whizzing around in a circle stopped, reverse direction, and that's when I must have been taken back and put back in the uh, room of the inn that I was staying in. So, uh, so it turns out, according to the regression I had, that that was the crop circle that I was the one that I thought was very wonderfully appropriate. Uh, that I was the one to find the next day and be uh, one of the first ones into to win. Wow. I love that synchronicity that you saw it, you know, yeah. obviously first oh, yeah. created it and then, but consciously you didn't know at the time. I mean, no, you, no. And, and through regression, okay. the information, information is there 